all between Israel and Slovenia. And in Group I, Cyprus 5-0 winners over San Marino. Belgium currently 2-1 up at home against Russia. But the standout scoreline really from the qualifiers today came in Kazakhstan, where Kazakhstan beat Scotland by three goals to nil. Uh, Kazakhstan ranked well outside the top 100 in the world rankings. Only three wins in their previous 40 competitive games, but they were 2-0 up inside 10 minutes, went on to add a third in the second half and a difficult, difficult night for Alec McLeish. Pat Nevin. Is there a slower, more downbeat version of, of the music? <laughs> Um, I don't know if we deserve that music. Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. The uh, words like humiliation, embarrassment all over the headlines. Is it that? Yeah, uh, I think I think so. Um, just looking at the, the team that Scotland put out. Now, any team can have a bad day. Mm. That, you know, that can happen. And they did. They had a bad day. The players that they expected to do well didn't have the greatest game. The likes of McGinn, who... You know, has done well with Villa. When he's played little bits for Scotland, he's generally been okay, very lively. McGregor, Armstrong. I mean, that's a strong-looking midfield that you've got there. Forrest has been really good for Celtic as well. So you're thinking about that, thinking that should be good enough. Um, the capabilities of McBurney and Burke as attacking players, you know, physically they look right. But we know from history for Scotland that they don't do it all the time. But for all that, the back line of... Palmer, Bates, McKenna, McKenna and Shinny. Mm. And you're saying to me, who? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Gra who? Graham, Graham Shinny is the one, I guess, that's come in for a lot of stick yeah. because the first two goals inside the opening 10 minutes both came down his side. And this is where you feel some sympathy for Alec McLeish because he is probably the two best young left-backs in British football in Kieran Tierney and Andy Robertson, and neither of them are available. Exactly. Uh, so that made a massive difference to him. There was quite a f few other call-offs as well. Anyone who doesn't know about it, Kazakhstan team play on a plastic pitch. So there are a good number of players who basically can't play on it um, and said they couldn't play. The clubs wouldn't let them play. So it was a make-do-and-men defence that was put in there. And, uh, you know, 10 minutes in and they're 2-0 down and they're in mm. great trouble anyway. Um, if I'm going to try and make an excuse, and I don't feel this, but I'll try and make, playing on those plastic surfaces is a joke anyway. Um, the worst, the worst um, games that I was involved in in my Scotland's career, and there weren't that many of them. Usually, it was in a stinker of a pitch. I remember one against Luxembourg, where you know it was about two, three inches of grass, maybe more than that, under a rock hard, bobbly surface, and you couldn't run with the ball. So sometimes the surface can make a difference as well. But even so, even so, you should be able to be structured and organised enough to make yourself hard to beat. Um, and Scotland just weren't up for it. Now and again, we've had utter, complete stinkers. And this was one of them. Um, against the Kazakhstan side, they're well outside the top 100. You know, 117, I think, in the world. Um, and if you get, a, you know, a fluky, unfortunate 1-0 defeat, then you almost kind of take it in the chin and it's embarrassing. But 3-0 and to be second best all over the place, which mm. it was really, really hard to take for Scotland. Um, so the, the next question, almost certainly for most, will be, well, is Alec McLeish, is he partially to blame for it? But you're right. He's probably put out the best group of players that's available to him, with the one exception of, could he have gone for some older players who are kind of not considered at the moment, brought them back in, you know, for that bit of security of, you know, they know the way around the, the international scene. Yeah. There was a lot of players that hadn't played many international games tonight. But you you stand by the results and by the decisions you make. And to be fair, that's a shocker of it, an absolute shocker of a result for a for a country that's been struggling for a long, long time. Just on the plastic pitch side of it, because it's something we'll have to uh, make do with as well over in Gibraltar on Saturday, and I know it's certainly uh, a consideration when it comes to somebody like Shawnee Maguire as to whether or not he can play in that game and then maybe go out against Georgia here at the Aviva on, on Tuesday night. Do lots of the teams in the Scottish Premier League not play in these 4G pitches? They do. There's um, quite a few. Kamarnock have got the 4G pitch. Actually, I was walking on it yesterday, of all times. I was up meeting Stevie Clark. Um, lots of people shout for Stevie Clark to be the next mm. Scotland manager yeah. as we speak just now. Um, and, the, you know, so it's there and it has been for quite some time. But I have to tell you, there's a lot of players in Scotland that don't, they're left out for that game. 
because they, they, when they play it, they're injured or are unable for weeks after, for a week or two afterwards. And it, any injury, it's a slight injury for those sorts of players, becomes you know a chronic injury that's out for a while. So they, A, some of them won't play in it anyway, but B, you're right. You should then be able to understand the different technique of having to play in that pitch. And it's a totally and utterly different technique. So don't go out and try and play your normal game on it, because if you do that, you won't be successful. You adapt your game to it. Scotland weren't able to as a group. Now, some of the players are not used to it. Some of them play, you know, down mm. south much more often. And you play once or twice away from home if you're the likes of McGregor, etc. Yeah. But yeah, the manager's I, got to look at a team and put a team out that's structured to cope with that. And if, if Scotland are doing well and if Alex McLeish is making a, a really good impression in these early months, do you think somebody like Ryan Fraser does turn up for this game? Is there partly an excuse culture sort of built in now to the Scottish national team that certain players just don't want to be part of it? Um, well, that was always the case, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, even in the time when I was playing, there was quite a few players that they, they picked and chose their games, you know, the ones that would suit them. And if there's a massive long hike out to Kazakhstan and a massive long hike back with the possibility of A, a bad surface or B, mm. You know, you're a possible bad result. You know, I remember times when certain players wouldn't play and their managers didn't want them to play. We're, Scotland's no different from the likes of Wales. I'm sure it's happened with Ireland as well. Well, well I was just wondering that somebody. because, like, Ryan Fraser is obviously having a, a, a brilliant season at Bournemouth and, and is such a talent for Scotland. And if a player of his ability refused to play for the Republic of Ireland because of the surface and his club was allowed to dictate that he wouldn't play, I think there'd be an absolute outcry from the supporters and people would turn them, them probably pretty quickly. Yeah. Like, is it that yeah, in Scotland yeah, that well. the Celtic and Rangers just dominates everything and people just sort of give and take the national yeah, we're team? Bit, we're a bit more used to it because there are that many uh, synthetic pitches up in Scotland and now we have knowledge of the players who can and can't cope with it. Um, those players just are left out, you know, and it's almost a... Right, we accept that. That's there's no point in playing him there because he won't play for the next two or three weeks, and that's grossly unfair right. to the clubs that pay his wages. So there's a kind of a bit of an acceptance there. Um, it's all very well for people like me. I didn't have a problem. I, did, I hate them anyway. I can't. I, I, I hate the fact that they're allowed at any level of top level football, be it Scottish Premier League or international football. Sometimes the odd Champions League games had them as well. I mean, to this day, I've never seen an enjoyable game of football at the top level on a plastic pitch. I just don't think it's good football. Um, but so what? You just need to deal with it. But I think one of the grown-up things a wee bit in Scotland is a lot of people do understand that, you know, I think Ryan Fraser's turned up for just about every game. You know, it's not... I don't think it's the travelling. I think it's that pitch that could wreck right. me. And if he did some sort of damage that damaged them for the rest of the season, well, that's grossly unfair. Yeah, no, that's uh, absolutely fair enough. Uh, again, like a result like this in Ireland would prompt national outrage and we'd be looking at our underage systems and why we're not creating the right kind of player and not, why we're not creating the greats of the 80s and the Pat Nevins and the Kenny Dugleishes and these type of players. Does that happen now in Scotland after a result like this? Yeah, it happens after every result that we get recently. <laughs> it happens all the time. And, and it's correct. We're not p producing the top quality players. Now, I mentioned that midfielder. Some of them are very good players. I mean, McGinn, I'd say McGregor, mm. you know, Armstrong. Armstrong's playing the Premier League and doing pretty well with a, a mid to lower table league team. Now, but the, the real star sort of turnouts that you want and also being able to go through the team and think, well, every one of them is capable of playing at the very top level in either England or Scotland, you know, Celtic and Rangers, etc. That's just not there anymore. It's, it's, it's gone a long distance away from that. Now, asking the question why those that number of good players isn't coming through. Because I'm looking at McTominay comes on for the bench. Mm. McTominay, I watched McTominay over in Paris against PSG. He was absolutely brilliant. He was a colossus. So there's some talent there. But you're right, it's a mix and match. And if you lost two, three, four players, or if you decide, right, get rid of a load of the old guard and bring in a whole new bunch. I mean, just a perfect example is Scotland had been in goal for this one. Of the three goalkeepers... I think they had a combined total of three caps between them. And that, that's after having goalkeepers that have been great for a long time. So if you bring in a new group, and there, a lot of them have got very, very few caps, and the, the strikers, none of them have got a goal between them yeah. for international level. So you're mixing and matching some guys that are good enough to play at that level. A lot that is a massive step up. I didn't top of that, you know, I'm not, not playing well. 
there isn't the strength and depth for in top international football. It's not there. There's no point pretending it is. It's been a, it's been generations since we qualified for anything. That ain't a fluke. That's that's happening. That has happened, and that's where Scotland are just now. And there's no point. I mean, and the next one you're going to get is right. You got to sack Alec McLeish because mm. I'm sure that would happen in Ireland as well. That's the next thing you, you go for sack Alec McLeish. And I'd say, yeah, sack him if you like. Get somebody else in. Just have the same problem. Because I felt about Gordon Strachan, I watched it very closely under his reign. Other than a couple of results, a couple of bad games, I think he absolutely maximised the potential of that group there. Mm. Didn't qualify, but that didn't matter. For me, all you can do is maximise the potential of the group. He did that. So why get rid of him? And they got rid of him just when it looked, you know, as if it was, you know, there were some really good um, performances. It was tight with some of the big teams as well. And, you know, you thought, right, you just trust that guy, stick with him. But we change managers so incredibly quickly. And there's a, there'll be a massive group of people saying, now get rid of Alan McLeish now. And good luck to the next guy who comes in. He'll look at it and think, what on earth? If he's any good, and if he's got like, you know, he's and a good job just now, is a cho- good possibility of getting a good job. He's going to look at Scotland and think, well, why should I come in for that? Yeah. Get pilloried for six months and get hoofed. Okay, you make a few quid, but suddenly your name is mud again. And in actual fact, I have absolutely no consideration it's the manager's fault. It's not that. It's far deeper than that in Scotland. This conversation sounds very, very similar to one we were having about three months ago <laughs> here in Ireland. Pat, we're very tight in time. Uh, thanks yeah. a lot for taking the call at short notice. Uh, a difficult day for Scotland. We'll chat to you again hopefully early next week when we can uh, go into it all in a bit more detail. I would love to say it was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's just not us for once. All right, Pat Nevin there. He'll be back, as always, every Monday night. Quick break, and then we'll be joined in the studio by Vinnie Perth. Football on Off The Ball. Brought to you by the new and improved Boyle Sports Bet Builder. Now with 44 markets to choose from on every match. Football Index is reinventing football betting. You can buy and sell the world's top players. Their value may go up and down, but it's not over with the final whistle like a regular bet. Football Index, reinventing football betting. Start building your portfolio today at footballindex.co.uk or download the app now. New customers only, minimum deposit and conditions apply. Gamble responsibly. McGurk's Golf brings you the ultimate fitting experience. Get treated like a pro for the day with the official tailor-made golf tour truck. Fitting days take place from the 1st to the 5th of April. Go to mcgurksgolf.com for further details. My name is Colm. We were buying a house. Our baby was on the way and mortgage protection was top of the list. I just called Lay of Life and it was sorted there and then. They listened and nothing fell forced and they were very practical. Lay of Life made what seemed to be a very complex procedure to be very simple. I could just concentrate now on turning my house into a home. Lay of Life. One life, many stories. Instant life insurance and now mortgage protection from as little as €10.10 10 per month. Call us or visit leialife.ie for a 10% online discount. Insurance provided by IPTQ Life SA. Leia Healthcare Limited trading as Leia Life and Leia Healthcare is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Colm received payment for his time making this commercial. Irish National Opera return to Borgosh Energy Theatre next March with Madama Butterfly, starring internationally renowned soprano Celine Byrne. Experience Puccini's heart-wrenching drama of fatal attraction in a new production of this exceptional opera. Four performances only from Sunday the 24th of March with the RTE Concert Orchestra. Tickets from €15 Euro are on sale now. Booking fees may apply. See BorgoshEnergyTheatre.ie Funded by the Arts Council. This is an emergency appeal from Concern Worldwide. Right now, Cyclone Edai is threatening the lives of more than 900,000 people in Malawi. Heavy rains and floods have washed away homes and displaced thousands. Please help Concern provide immediate shelter and life-saving essentials to those most in need. Call 1850 410510 or visit concern.net today to give what you can. Thank you. It's the big brand event at Curry's PC World with laptops from just 159. Save 240 euro on a HP 14-inch laptop with Intel Core i5 processor, now only 599. Or save 110 euro on the Bosch 9 kilo washing machine, just 499. And get free delivery on all Bosch large kitchen appliances. In TVs, get a Samsung 49-inch QLED TV from just 949, or a Sony 49-inch Smart 4K TV from just 649. At Curry's PC World, we help you get it right. Season C's apply.
Off the ball. This is News Talk. All right, you're very welcome back to the football show. I'm delighted to be joined in studio by the Dundalk head coach, Vinnie Perth. How are you? Good, yeah. All is good. Uh, you, you were a little bit delayed. You, uh, you had Richard Dunn in. Yeah, he came in. Afternoon. He came in to uh, to watch us train this morning. So uh, he spent the day with us, um, met a lot of the players, and uh, I think they got a real boost from that. So, um, and then our chairman is in at the moment. So he introduced the two lads, and um, yeah, he seemed to enjoy his day. Actually, he he, um, he was quite surprised by some of the facilities we had. Uh, quite surprised by the standard of of training yeah. and. Um, Obviously, me and Richard are close, so he really enjoyed it. You go way back, day. do you? Yeah, we grew up um, three, four doors away from each other. So the, the two families are, you know, this Irish thing where you're sort of your cousin, mm. he's your cousin, but he's not your cousin type of thing. And we used to share bread and milk maybe between houses at different stages. So, yeah, we've been very, very close. And um, at different stages, we you drift apart at different stages. But generally, for the last sort of 20, 25 years, we've, we've kept close and... He hasn't um, given you use of the house in the south of France yet? No, I have been down and I've been on the boat, so I've experienced that. And I hear it, I hear it talked about quite a lot in this show. So, uh, What's I've the been boat called? Jeez, uh, I can't even remember now. The sure Miracle so. of Moscow. Yeah, um, I could think of a few other names, but we stick with <laughs> Yeah, We invited ourselves down once to do a show and he said definitely 100% come, but... Uh, Nothing's ever come of that, unfortunately. No, uh, that'd be quite like him. Um, I've turned up once or twice and he hasn't been there as well, so <laughs> I'd be very Not careful. Not to the south of France, I presume. Yeah, I'd be very careful what you <laughs> what you agree to with him, yeah. I'd imagine you've various people coming in and out of the camp over the course of a, a season and over the course of the last couple of years because people are interested in how Dundalk have managed to achieve what they've achieved. Do you find people are generally surprised at, at the standard that's there? Yeah, I think even like this year we've signed a couple of players from outside of Ireland and I think um, Sean Murray was sort of, even facility-wise, um, and we sort of undersell ourselves in League of Ireland in terms mm. of facilities and standards. But Sean would have played 70 times plus in the Championship and he was, he was sort of taken aback of the level of, of training, the level of detail and sort of the hunger within particularly our own group, I can only speak for our group, but he was, and he, he, he would say it openly, the sort of uh, standard in which they train and the level of intensity they train at, and he wasn't expecting that, so people sort of, and, and we undersell ourselves as a league, I think, mm. in terms of, um, we look at, oh, England is the holy grail, and you look at, um, some of our players have gone away to England and some have come back and, you know, we, for example, we'd have a full-time kit man in with us this year and when they finish training, they go, they go from the training ground to into the gym and, like, there's a fresh T-shirt and fresh pair of shorts there and to, to people who are playing in League 1, League 2, that's not the norm. Like, we look at these great big stadiums and big mm. crowds of eight, 9,000, but um, it's the other stuff where players aren't as looked after as people think they are. And England and Scotland isn't necessarily the holy grail for these players. Yeah. I guess the, the problem within the league is that there's huge differences between the top and the bottom. That that isn't the norm either in the League of Ireland, I'd imagine. Yeah, but that's, I mean, we we set out on this sort of, I don't know, a journey's probably too big of a word, but six and a half years ago, mm. we, Dundalk were, were training part-time. And when Stephen and myself, and obviously when Stephen, I really should say, took over, um, I took over with him, but... We were part time. We were training in the evenings. We didn't have a full time kit man. We didn't have full time, you know, uh, strength and conditioning coaches. We didn't have, um, you know, we had a physio, obviously. So, what what has been achieved and and the success that has come over them six years has meant the players have been rewarded. And um, look, also means the players have no excuses. Yeah. That, that well, when when you're starting out, actually, you know, if if, if it, there's a bit of an amateurish feel, they can act quite amateurish. Whereas now. It sounds like it's a relatively high-performing unit. Yeah, we we built this high-performance centre, but no, excuses. Player, like we, uh, as human beings, we'll always look for excuses. But I think it's important to sort of and, and and to make that point to stress that yes, Dundalk have a lot of stuff going for them. But in terms of what we can offer player, and we can we can bring players from the UK over and say, you know, you're not coming over. It's not you know part-time football. It's not sort of of a lesser standard. In fact. We think you'll actually train harder with us than you would at your previous club. I wouldn't sort of mention any clubs, but I think people could come out of the SBL for argument's sake. And obviously, the, the SBL has improved over the, the last sort of 
12, 18 months, I think the standard has really increased at that level. But they're coming out of clubs like in the SPL, I think they're, they're probably training at a higher standard, in my opinion, with ourselves and I would say a couple of other clubs. And um, just like you, you made the point, just, uh, you know, that's not the case all the way through the league. But to be fair to our players, they've, they've won that on the pitch. They didn't mm. come into that. They've, they've sort of built that. And yes, we have new owners in the club, but the new owners in the club last 12 months, this was, this was built uh, by Stephen, by everybody in the club over the past six years and previous owners. So I think, um, I think we have a really high standard up there, but I think other clubs are, are not that far behind yeah. as, as people think. Are you very hands-on on the training pitch? Yeah, I am. Like I obviously was. Um, I, I obviously I'm a coach, and that's what my background is. And um, under Stephen, it would have been just. I wouldn't say just the two of us, but it would have been the two of us would have done a lot of the of the work. And, and the staff now, and the way football has gone, the staff mm. has got bigger. There's, you know, there's analysts in, there's strength and conditioning coaches in. But I would have been very hands on, and I would have been sort of done predominantly most of the training under Stephen's sort of guidance so it would have been the two of us done a lot of that so um, that's Would you have had a very similar outlook? Yeah I think we have the same beliefs like um, and, and some people ask me what are them beliefs and I, it's, it's for, they're very difficult to put into words but I think we have the same beliefs in the sense of free, and fro free, free flowing football and if the other team score four we'll score five and, and I mean that's the simplest way I can put it to you in terms of yeah we'd like to not concede any but if they do score four we'll, we'll go and get five ourselves and and we have we have the same beliefs, and um, I think um, the modern day coach, the modern day manager, the modern day person is very hands on. And I mean, I wouldn't put myself in the same sentence in any way, shape, or form. But when you look at videos of Guardiola, he's on the pitch. He's you know he's very very much dictating mm. style of play. And I think the modern day coach that's what that's what he does, and and sort of that's the way it's done. Now. So obviously a lot of people were wondering at the start of the season how this was going to work out with Dundalk because you don't have your pro license yes. yet. You're part of this new group yeah. with with Robbie Keane and Andy Reid and Damien Duff and yeah. Jim McGuinness. Weirdly, the pro license from everything we've heard is more geared towards the management side of it than the coaching side of it. There's, there's opportunities to go abroad and, and learn from uh, best practice, I guess, in terms of coaching, but it's more an education in how to manage yeah. a club. So when you finish... Do you envisage becoming the manager of Dundalk or do you expect that you will remain as the head coach? Well, I don't think, look, there's a lot being spoken about that and um, there's a lot being written about the sort of the current setup. And I think we, we've, we've done something different in Dundalk. Um, I don't think it's any secret if the rules hadn't changed back mm. in October that I would have been appointed manager. But we've gone down a different a different route. We've, um, we've decided to, to sort of manage the, the club in a different way so we've appointed myself as head coach the, the club felt that um, for continuity that I had to be central to everything that was going on in the club going forward and um, we had to respect the FEI in terms of their license department um, and you know I hear people saying things like you know other clubs just copy and paste on docs statement that's been probably said in this stu studio about 20 30 times but it's not as simple as that it's anything but I think you've got to in in John Gill I hired w as a club we hired somebody that had already previously managed the club mm. he's someone that even if I had been appointed manager and the rules hadn't changed I would have brought into the club so um and it also allows me then as head coach to sort of get involved with our under 13s 15 17s and 19 set up and um, that's a huge sort of change in, in the League of Ireland clubs and it needs to be led and I don't think it, it can be just a token gesture so um, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a different setup, um, and it's a, but at the same time um, it's something that we feel is working and something that if I have my pro licence in, in sort of a year's time we're not going to change it all of a sudden and, and, and ask anybody to leave or all of a sudden yeah. change. I think it's a structure that we'll continue to work with. So who picks the team then? Well, the, the, team, is, the team is picked. Everyone has specific roles in our club, OK? I coach the team. Um, and that allows me sort of on the pitch, you know, be involved in, in the training setup and everything. We have, John comes in with very clear first team coach roles and that's his sole focus. And mine is sort of an overall sort of the whole club 
And um, again, but between the whole lot of us, between the players, between um, everybody in the club, mm. we sort of are all very clear what our roles are. And we, we, we continue to build on that. And I think it's been quite successful uh, so far, albeit a couple of results haven't gone away. And apparently it's a disaster because we've drawn two games in the first two games. But I think well, things that's, are that's working. the pressure of managing a big club. Yeah. I think things are working uh, for us. We've probably, we're probably, albeit with a similar start to what we've had last year, but I've been here, this is the start of my seventh season, so I, I sort of like to think I know better than anybody um, how the team is playing and, and sort of where they're at. I think they're ahead of, or ahead of where we ever have been before. I think we're in a good position. I certainly feel it's probably the best squad we've ever had as a club. Mm. And, um, but, but so do you have total control of the way the side play, of the tactics? No, I, I don't. I, like, I, I, we haven't changed our tactics. That's the word we've always used is that continuity. It's not a, it's not a word we use just to, for a game or to sort of build smoke screens. Mm. I think um, this, the way we play hasn't changed. I mean, we were we were sort of criticised in terms of our performance against Sligo Rovers. I mean, if you analyse that game, we've probably created more chances in that game than we have in any other game the last six, seven seasons. The fact is, if we win that five-one. Everyone says Dundalk are back. They are what they they continue to do what they are doing. So, um, I think I think um, we're in a good place, and um, we're not like we're not we're not looking to change the way we play. We haven't changed how we play. In fact, we're looking to improve in how we how we play and, and probably keep the ball more, create more chances, and score more goals. And we probably I think last year we broke the record of most goals ever scored mm -hmm. in League Four in history. So that is a target for the group to go and beat that this year. So um, there's, n there's no change of style or there's no, it's just continuing on what we're doing. How did that week back in November play out for you when we had Martin O'Neill leading the team to, to Denmark? He gets fired a couple of days later. It looks as though Mick McCarthy's going to get the job on a regular basis. Uh, yeah. And then all of a sudden Stephen Kenny's name is thrown into the mix. Were you down at Stephen O'Donnell's wedding? Yeah, I was at Stephen O'Donnell's wedding. Um, um, I probably had a little bit of an inkling that there's something was happening, um, more than uh, more than most. Um, the week before, I'd be lying if I didn't say I hoped Stephen had got the job. I had a head of of Mick at the time because of my connection to Stephen. I felt it, it was the right time for him to become the manager. I still do, um, but it was it was a strange couple of days. Mm. Um, obviously, Stephen made that decision early Saturday morning, Stephen's wedding, Stephen O'Donnell's wedding was on the Friday, and he, he contacted me early Saturday morning and said, I need, to, I need to see you, and we need to have a chat. I sort of knew what that meant, I was very clear, I knew what that meant. And um, I couldn't even say anything to the players at that stage, and unfortunately by the time I left Stephen O'Donnell's wedding and met with Stephen, literally five minutes after we sat and Stephen sat down, my phone started beeping because the news had broken within that period, so I couldn't get back to the wedding, I couldn't explain it to the players, I couldn't, and Stephen couldn't either, so it was disappointing in that sense, and we sort of left the players then, I spoke to a couple of the staff were there, and, and it was good for them as a group, you had to sit down together. Mm. And, and did you think when, when you got the call from Stephen that you'd be going with him? Um, no, I, I wouldn't, I'd never be that presumptuous, um, I felt that um, and probably still feel that we were a very, very good team together. Um, I think Stephen is brilliant. He's a brilliant manager. I think I, I certainly would say what I, what I brought to him helped him be brilliant mm. manager. Um, and what he brought to me helped me be a brilliant coach. So I believe we were, we were just a good team together. Um, so. But I wasn't presumptuous in any way, shape, or form. Um, but very, very clear in that conversation, or very early in the conversation, Stephen made it clear that um, there, w there was it, it just wasn't going to happen, and for various reasons. So I knew where I stood very clearly at that stage. Were you disappointed, or yeah, naturally I would have been disappointed at the time um, um, because I would have had the same ambitions as, as Stephen. So um, in my position, I feel that. Um, over those sort of last five or six seasons, um, I would have played a, a certain role in terms of Dundalk's success. Stephen has got the job on the back of Dundalk's success, so yeah, I was disappointed. But at the same time, um, it was very clear to me 
from within an hour of that conversation that, that the, I'd had contact from America to say, we want you very central to um, everything that's gone forward in Dundalk, which was a huge sort of vote of confidence. And it probably would have cost the FEI a bit of money to get me out of my, my contract. I had just signed a new full-time contract. So I understood the situation I was in. So for me, it was I moved on fairly quickly. But, mm. but it would be wrong to say I wasn't disappointed. I, I felt... It was. I felt I had done. I had done enough to be part of of that next sure. move as well. Yeah, yeah. People, I guess, need to be selfish in these roles. And when opportunities comes up, come up, like, do you, did you think? And I don't know if you'd ever had this conversation as to what might come next. Did you Did you feel that you would have always been a team, or was there always the possibility that Stephen was front of house and uh, that in football anything can happen? But like, I think when you're involved in football and. Um, and whether it's under eight, under twelve, fourteen, you always dream. You always dream. Like so, I di when there was talk of Stephen Kenny becoming the next manager, I dreamed of being becoming the next. And I probably wouldn't have got the assistant manager's role. That would have been somebody with a bigger name. Mm. But I did. I did have visions of standing at a European Championship. I did have visions of going to a World Cup with him. And um, you know. I'd be telling lies if I said that yeah. wasn't wasn't what I dreamed or what I thought of or when I was on the treadmill when your mind goes and, and you daydream I would have thought of that around that time but Was there a chance to plead your case or was it that sort of situation? No it wasn't that situation in any way shape or form as I said um, I, I'd moved on I like in my position as assistant manager I was very very close to the players so within that sort of window my first thought was how do I relay this to the players how do I how do I tell them that there's no sort of, we won't have, you know, this this yeah. this train is not going to break. And straight away I switched on to, I've got to look after the players. That's a, that, that must have been a d very difficult day for you then, because on one hand, like there's, as you say, there is a disappointment there that yeah. maybe this opportunity has, hasn't gone the way you thought it would. But another opportunity has opened itself up that you're going to be able to take charge of this team for the coming years. And you're, the first impression you now make is the new manager, the new head coach, is pretty important. Yeah, uh, I th like, I think it wasn't, there wasn't a sense of disappointment. I didn't feel let down. I didn't feel any, any of that stuff. There was, because there was none of that. When you work with Stephen Kenny, you become so loyal to him that, um, first of all, I was absolutely, it was a bit emotional, emotional for both of us. Like, it was full of joy for him. Um, and his family and everything mm. that came with it. For me, then, I had to switch. I've always been that person, the link between the players and, and Stephen, or, or just being the player's sort of friend, for want of a better word, or someone they could rely on. So, um, listen, it was one of them things. I then, I knew very quickly that I was going to be central to what was happening in, in the club going forward. I felt I was always central to it over the last six or seven years anyway, again, under the stewardship of Stephen. So it was one of them situations where um, you just move on very quickly. I wasn't, I, it'd be wrong to say I was disappointed. I think I was, because I had dreamed of going to European Championships, I still dreamed of going, of going to a World yeah. Cup. Anyone that's involved with football doesn't dream of going to a World Cup. They, they're not in the right planet. And hey, who knows how the next couple of years <laughs> plan well, out with the Irish team. Challenge, yes. do, do, you, do you still have a relationship now then? Like, is he someone you can lean on for a bit of advice or did you need a bit of a clean break and no, be your own man? I think um, when you work so closely with someone for six, six and a half years and before that I'd, I played under him, he gave me a break in League of Ireland, I'd worked him uh, when he was at Derry, I'd done a lot of work from him. Um, I would say to you that we have a very, very good relationship. He is one of the closest people to me in life, so and I don't see that changing. We don't talk every day the way we used to, but at the same time, it'd be regularly contact yeah. between us. Yeah. You've got to get used to any fixture congestion now as well, caused by these uh, under-21 call-ups and, and senior call-ups. Yeah, absolutely. He's, yeah. he's on the other side. Yeah, well, look, I mean, he does wear an FAI cap so now, so that's fine. Um, I've no issue with that. Um, but... It's it, listen. We we certainly not going to complain about these fixtures. Mm. We're not going to. Um, that's not what we do. But the problem with the fixtures is it's very clear for me that one there is a risk of injuries for everybody in the league, and we're probably better equipped. Some of the the teams at the higher end are better equipped to deal with that. Um, but the problem for is the is the quality of the games is going to suffer. Ten games and sort of. 
34, 35 days is just not, not good enough. A game every three days is yeah. not going to lead to a good game. We played Shamrock Rovers um, yeah, I was a at couple it, yeah. of weeks back. And to be honest with you, two really good sides who were tired. It was the fourth game in 14 days and we at the start of the season and they weren't ready. There has been an argument that they do this in the championship, but I think that's slightly different because of the resources that are available at the championship clubs. We're behind uh, in resources um, and in squad sizes, but yeah, it's ridiculously oh. front-loaded, the season. Yeah, and look, my, I, I understand the FAI aren't in a good, posi a difficult position because they have to protect teams in Europe. And when you go up a level in Europe, you do need a weak lead into games. It's just, if you, if you want our teams to be successful in Europe, you've got to give that. But at this stage, I think the clubs are so stable. I think extending the, the league and making it longer is very, very... Mm. We're no longer clubs really struggling to pay wages. I think a lot of clubs are in a good in a good place now. The league needs to be needs to be longer and that I think that will improve the quality of games. We've seen huge crowds turning up. I was in the we were in the Brandywell last week and it was it was just a joy to be in. It was a good stadium, a good crowd and it was a good game because both teams had had a week to build into one. It was really a smashing game of football. So I think they just need to be cleverer in how they manage these fixtures. I was out with Stephen Kenny yesterday. Uh, we're going to play the interview out on on Saturday's show, and like it's it's refreshing sitting with him and listening to him talk about tactics and his philosophy on the game, and happy friend, and you could see the excitement in his yeah. face that working with Quivin Kelleher and Gavin Bazuno on their ability as goalkeepers with the football at their feet, and you can see his 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 mind working hard and how he can start plotting the future with these guys over the next few years. You have a very similar style then, you have very similar thoughts on yeah. the game. To get that across the players though, that you're now in charge with your style. Like, do you say to them, nothing's changing here, we're going to do exactly what we've done for the last five, six, seven years? Or do you, did you, like, how, how do you make sure that players know well, it was there a, is a certain to change? To be honest, it was a perfect storm in terms of for, for the, for, when the, when the new, on the 6th of January, when the players came in, there was a new management team in front of them. It was a perfect storm. I'd been working in the background and on our, we have a centre of excellence now. The club have spent close to £500,000 on new changing rooms for the players. The, the new gym, there's a video analyst room, there's a, a, a canteen for the players in the morning. So when they arrived, they moved into a new building. Mm. Okay, so we were able to change things and we were able to improve different bits and pieces. We, we hired a dietitian into the club that wasn't there previously and we're constantly, and that would have happened under Stephen anyway, but we're constantly adding to where we've been and we've done that over, over the sort of six years. So it was a perfect storm for us to say, um, when the players came back, this is, this is the new way, but it's the same way with just improved ideas and, and we've always improved things over the last six years and we've always been open to there's a lot of talk of Instat at the moment. We've been using Instat for three years. We've been sort of, I could nearly, I could nearly coach the coaches how to use it in the league now. But which and it's great that Instat has come into a league. We've been ahead of the game there. So our job and my job is to stay, is to do whatever's next to stay ahead of the game in terms of whether it's a dietitian or whatever that little edge may be. And um, I think it was a perfect storm. The club really. Uh, the owners really backed us. They put this building together for us. We move into a new building and players see everything has improved. So I think it's just a perfect storm for us. Is it very simple for you taking over that winning the league is a must? Um, yeah, I think winning the league at a club like Dundalk is, is the number one goal, but also improvement in Europe has always been something that we're focused on. Um, Europe is, is, is really on the players' mind. Mm. Um, they felt... They didn't do themselves justice last year, and um, it's an area we're looking to improve in. So, league and Europe are, are are no different. They're really targets of of the whole group. Yeah, uh, and you all took a lot of pride in the way you approached Europe previously, and that the success came without really changing tactics or style. That yeah. actually you were going to go out and try and play football. You weren't going to sit back and let the opposition dominate possession. Is that the way forward, do you think, for this year in Europe, for the coming years? Do you need to add a, another level of pragmatism? Like, did you, What did you learn from last year's European disappointments? Um, look, we, we got a couple of things wrong last year in terms of that game and away. And it was a, we probably ran out a little bit of luck in the sense of we with a couple of players out of form, with a couple of players coming back mm. from injury, and we probably 
had no choice but we picked the wrong team because there was a couple of guys just not in that right moment. But um, in league games, I mean, we've, we regularly keep possession over 60%. Okay, So, for example, you know, you can't say to a player nine days in a row, you, we want you to pass, pass, pass press, 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 and then turn into another game just because it's your and go, don't press today, don't mm -hmm. pass today. It doesn't work. You have to have a belief, you have to stick with it, and you have to sort of back yourself on it. And it's something we've done over the last sort of six years, as I keep saying. But I'm not gonna, I don't think we need to get away from that. The players won't want to get away from that. Um, so, you know, we will continue to do the same things and believe we're doing them the right way. Every so often, like what happened to us last year, we'll get caught out. But I'd rather, I'd rather fail trying to do things the right way than hanging in and sort of looking for a miraculous result. It's just not going to happen regularly mm. enough. Uh, Jack Byrne is obviously flavour of the month at the moment and, and deservedly so. Played pretty well, I thought, in that draw with Dundalk in the first half managed yeah. to get himself involved and you probably curtailed it a bit as the as the game went on but was obviously exceptional in front of Mick McCarthy against Sligo last week you've got a lot of talented players as well though like Michael Duffy is somebody who seemed at the end of Martin O'Neill's time was somebody who was considering and getting something like Patrick McElhaney back as well from Oldham you have a lot of talented players to work with there yeah I mean Look, I think it's fantastic for Jack Bourne. Um, as someone who's been in and around the league for the last 25 years, it's sort of stuff like what Jack has done, what Stephen Kenny has done, fills me with, with mm. pride, okay? Really, really proud. Um, do I believe we have players who could be internationals? Absolutely. Michael, Michael O'Connor switched his allegiance from Northern Ireland to Repu or Michael Duffy switched his allegiance to, to, to Republic of Ireland. Um, do I believe, my yes, do. Mick hasn't seen us live, okay, since he's taken over. So in time, I'd like to think he will see what we have to offer. I believe some of our players are, are more than capable. Can uh, you do anything about that, or is that as as that just tended to be sort of potluck as to what games Mick turns up at? Well, I mean, ultimately that's his job. Like, and I must must very much say I've met Mick now. I think on three different occasions between the pro license, between at the RT Sports Awards and. He's been outstanding to me. He just, he just was just one of the nicest guys I've ever met in football. Mm. Um, so he's just a brilliant person and very positive, and someone who I can understand why. I've spoken to Richard actually only today about him to say, you know, you can see why people want to play. I was going him. to ask that actually because I, I, I know there was a frustration probably in certain League of Ireland circles that week when the decision was been made about maybe the way Stephen Kenny was been spoken about and the way Mick McCarthy because so many ex-players in the media played under Mick McCarthy and they all yeah. rave about him they did in this studio like Gary Breen and yeah. Kevin Coban can't speak highly enough where they just wouldn't know Stephen in the same way and it ended up into a sort of one or the other and would Stephen be respected in the dressing room or actually now having met Mick McCarthy you can kind of see why yeah. why people speak about him so well yeah yeah, and I understand that I mean and the, the challenge I suppose the challenge for for us all is to, and for Stephen or whoever it is, like if Stephen was in had achieved with a club from Slovakia what he did with Dundalk, he would be Slovakia national team manager, okay? And um, we use barometers of what people we use England as a barometer, and we need to get away from that. It, people from England are struggling to play in the Premiership at this stage, mm. you know, because of it's such an international league. I have no doubt Stephen would be more than capable to hold his own in any dressing room. Um, he'd inspire players. He'd make them. He'd make them want to play for him. Um, he brought a side to you know uh, Zenit Saint Petersburg. Someone like Witzel was playing as a number six that day. There was Giuliano, Brazilian international. Christ, Christoph was playing fullback for Italy at the time, and he he went there with no fear. He went there. He made sure his team passed the ball and played. I've no doubt he'd do the same thing with Ireland. I think he'd give the players the belief to be able to do that. And as a nation, if you if you listen to social media, if you if you read all of this, that's what we want. So um, I don't think it take long for him to convince the players. Um, you know, he can help them do that and go to whether it's going to Russia or whether it's going to Sweden or wherever the game may be. I think he has the ability to do that. Um, but at the same time, I've been so impressed with Mick um, since he's he's taken over. Um, that I can understand why people like Kevin, people mm. would would speak. Richard speak so highly of him because again I see the two of them, different characters, but at the same time the same people in terms of getting 
getting the best out players. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming to the studio, Vinny. You're getting a bit of a break this week, are you? Yeah, a handy week. Um, I'd rather play, but at the same time, we'll get a week off and um, we've, we're have we back on pro license duty next week, so um, that'll be an interesting week again. All right, we'll enjoy that. Thanks a lot for coming to the studio. Lot. We'll take a quick break.